As the city of Natchez observes its 300th anniversary, we can't let it go by without recognizing one of the city's most celebrated literary natives. Richard Wright was born near Natchez in 1908 and died at the young age of 52 in Paris, France, but not before winning international acclaim with such works as Native Son and Black Boy. His memory is kept alive through the literary circles of Natchez and historical markers that bear his name like this one. Today we're talking with one of Wright's relatives, Charles Wright, about how Natchez shaped his literary form. Charles, thank you for joining us today. Now, how exactly are you related to the great author Richard Wright? Richard Wright uh, and my mother, first cousin. Okay. Okay, his, his father mm -hmm. and my grandfather are brothers. And so that made him my second cousin. Okay. Uh -huh. And you do, I mean, you know, I think to understand Richard Wright and to understand his writings, and, and I got to tell you, I mean, I read them in high school, and I always knew of the Paris connection, and I always knew of the Chicago part, and uh -huh. some of the New York and some of the other places he lived, but I never understood that he was from Natchez until mm -hmm. I came down here and saw Richard Wright Highway and the markers <laughs> and everything else. And you do something that I think is unique and pretty special uh -huh. is that you give people tours around the, the city uh -huh. and around the area to let people understand exactly why Richard Wright was Richard Wright. Yes, yeah. yes I do. Talk about, let's, talk, let's just go ahead and take the viewers through a tour. Where, where okay. would be the first place we go? Well, uh, the first place, well first I will give you a, a short PowerPoint and then from there we would go to the Forks of the Road. Okay. And uh, I always say that the Forks of the Road is the beginning of my family, period. Yeah, because uh, there uh, we have three of our great great grandfather that was they were uh, slaves and slaved on the Rucker plantation, mm -hmm. and in the uh, just before the war they ran away and joined the Union Army at the Forks of the Road, right. and there their names are there at this time. And where's the forks in the road for people that aren't familiar with okay. Natchez? Forks of the road is uh, St. Catherine okay. and 61 South mm -hmm. and Liberty Road. Okay. So you've got that triangle there and yeah. that same triangle today was there then, Okay. believe it or not. Yeah. And that's also my home. Literally, I was born that's, there. Okay. And so, but anyway, that is where I begin our tour. And uh, from there we go to uh, Fenwick, where Richard Wright was actually, uh, where he was born and raised in that area. Right. Now, there, if you read Black Boy, mm -hmm. he tells you about the, first he tells you about the hardship. Right. And then he tells you about his entertainment. And one of them was to listen at the train that passed his, near his house every night. And believe it or not, that track is still there and is still being used today. The train still goes by. So if you're taking a group there, a train could come by and you're saying, there you go, you're leaving there the There the train right? is right there. And the very next thing was the... Uh, the owls. Now I can take you out at this time of the year, yeah. and we can stand and we can hear the owls hollering all night. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just hoot and holler, and it it kind of takes you into uh, when you read Black Boy. It kind of takes you into the area of what he was talking about, uh, the field that he felt as a child. Yeah, and. Uh, you look at the terrain where he lived. It was hilly, no real uh, farmland. Right. I don't even know how they made a living there, but they did. And he uh, talked of hunger. And I can imagine in this area that there was not very much food or there was very little that was there, right. you know, and he's, he always was hungry. And he had to entertain himself in some some form or fashion. 
And so what he did, he went out and did a lot of little devious things like uh, messing with the dog and the cats and things of that nature he spoke about. But anyway, it was, it was very devastating for him. And uh, his mother, she worked at the Traveler's Rest Plantation. Mm -hmm. That's where she would go and uh, clean or whatever. Right. And he was there with her. And from there, she would travel along a route to take uh, church and there she taught Sunday school, believe it or not. And they walked, and we're talking of about two miles. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and they would walk there, and he would, they would talk, you know, she would teach school there. And they were in that, that area for several years until she decided to move to Natchez and to be with some of her people Mm -hmm. over on Roseland. And at Roseland, here's another story of Richard Wright, where he uh, was bored. He always was bored. Boy. He always had to do well, he something. He was incredibly intelligent at yeah, a very so early age. Yeah. Just sitting there doing nothing. Yeah. He, he, was, he, was, he was. But anyway, he said the, uh, the curtain is afire. And the house was in the process of burning, burning down. Yeah. And what happened to him, he ran out of the house and ran under the house. That wasn't a good plan. No, it wasn't a <laughs> plan at all. <laughs> but anyway, he, he did that. And this house is still there today. Really? Uh -huh. So they got the fire out. I they did yeah. get the fire out. And, uh, so the lesson is, kids, if you're bored, don't set the curtains on fire. Don't set the curtains on fire, and plus you get a good whooping. I'm surprised he lived past the age of yeah, 12. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm surprised too. Yeah. But he was a very creative individual, yeah. <laughs> believe it or not, he was. And uh, he did quite a few things that, uh, that was intriguing, you yeah. know, and uh, he constantly talked about food. He didn't have food. He, yeah. Man, he was, he was very hungry. So from there, they moved from here and went on to uh, Memphis. Yeah. I mean, to Jackson, to Jackson. Being from Jackson to Memphis. Yeah, he went to Smith Robertson School, Smith which is Robertson a museum Home. now in right. Jackson. Right, that's it, true. And the, the amazing thing about him was he had no formal education up to that point, and then he goes no. there and becomes the valedictorian. True. Yeah. And if you, you know, I, I, I there was one story I would like to talk, well, it's a couple of stories sure. I would like to talk about uh, in his here. book, is yeah. that, uh, Becoming a man. Yeah. I can, when I look at this movie, and uh, I read part of the book and I looked at the movie, and uh, it was kind of interesting for me to see to where he was coming from in this movie. Yeah. Because, uh, in this story, because it was, you know, one of his short stories, and I can see him wanting, looking at his father, working in the fields, yeah. and his mother is uh, doing her chores for the big house yeah. and the father and then him, and he's out in the fields helping his father, yeah. which he never did himself as an individual, but he saw it being done. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he wanted to leave there and become a, what, a man. You know, he yeah. felt that he could be somebody, and, I, and in that you can see if you go into the area and look around, you can feel what he was talking about because it was, uh, it was so intense in the movie that you can just feel uh, what, where he's coming from. Yeah. And so he did acquire a gun. Wow. And he thought the gun was uh, something that gave him power. Which because takes he, place today. Right, yeah. and it does. It, 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 that gun gets it and he, he shoots it, and boom, it kills this man's mule. Now he's got to pay for it. He doesn't understand the power of the gun, what the gun is right. really designed for, and he just sees it as a power tool. Yeah. And so what he does, he ran away from home with that gun. And this, uh, in, so many, in his, so many instances today, that young people 
will take something, never, you know, research it as they should, mm -hmm. and run with it without any knowledge of what's going on. And that's why we have, I say today, a lot of problems that we do have among our young people. Another one uh, is The Clock. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a short story mm -hmm. where the, uh, he, the young man, he goes into town to sell his goods and the white guy comes to his house and he has a relationship with his wife. Now, where are we going with this? I, during the family, yeah. and this would be during his time frame, Right. this actually happened. Really? Uh, and uh, that individual that was born to the woman, she, he finally left and they never did find where he went. Right. But uh, at that time they called him a what, mulatto. Right. And uh, he passed for white and went on. So I read to write after seeing several of these things in his life, this is how he wrote his books, you see. Uh, native son, mm -hmm. he was reaching out. He saw a hardship here. He looked across the pond and he saw the white families. They were living much better. But he am over here, he had to get their leftovers. Yeah. And so this fueled him too. Why is this happening? Why? You think about certain aspects of his life, and you, you spoke about yeah. his father, but his father leaving at a very early age, I think, left big scars on him, and then his mother very being, much so. mother getting ill yeah. also, I think, mm -hmm. too. And, and, you know, not, I mean, just on top of, like you said on the tour, you go to around different places and how rough the land yes. is, how tough the land yeah. is. So he, by the time he got to where he was riding, he had a whole lot of hurt he built had, up. He had hurt that was built up in him that was unreal. Yeah. Uh, and he had to, to get vent down. it. Yeah. He vented it. And yeah. he, he saw this uh, individual that was writing. And uh, that's where he began to write, you know. He saw that there was power in words, you know, and, and putting it on paper. And he did that, you know. Uh, and when he, when he came back to Natchez after many years, I think he had married, and uh, not to his uh, former wife, but his first, you know. And she was a dancer, I believe. And he came back and he was gonna talk to his sister, Joanna. Yeah. And uh, wanted her to go back with him because she could dance. Yeah. She was uh, a very good dancer. And uh, so she refused to go because his daddy was very sick. And his dad had come back, yeah. Yeah, his dad had come back at this time. And he had left Memphis and came yeah. back to uh, Natchez. And he was a real broke, or as Richard Wright referred to him as a broken man or a sick man or what have you, you know. And she stayed with him and cared for him. And, uh, but at this time, Richard Wright began to, uh, he couldn't get any amens one way or the other. And in the meantime, the Rhythm Nightclub had burned. That's right. And he came and he went and he saw now. The uh, let me ask you real quick um, about the nightclub fire. Because a lot of people don't know about that. It was one of the worst disasters in the United States history. It was. It was. The band that was there, yeah. believe it or not, was a uh, just passing through. And they thought they would stop there, and everybody knew that they were coming. I think it was coming from either New Orleans going to Memphis or Memphis going mm -hmm. to New Orleans. One of so the they're two. a big, pretty big act. Yeah, yeah, it was an act, and they and people came from all over Mrs. I mean, say all over this area. Yeah, horses, buggies, and what have you, and they had all the uh, hay and what have you in the, in the loft of yeah. the place, and it caught fire and. The, they had barred the doors in the back so people couldn't sneak in and what yeah. have you. And uh, it caught fire. 
It's like 200 people died. And, and uh, better, yes. Yeah, more and, than that. And, yeah, and uh, what happened was they, when they tried to get out, they, sta they, just they stampede, yeah. and they found a lot of them at the door. Oh, wow. Trying to get out, and it just burned yeah. down. Uh, there's all kinds of stories of why it started, and from yeah. one thing to another, but we don't know that for a fact. Yeah. We just know all those people were uh, killed here. Yeah. And uh, even to this day, the, the, uh, where the concrete floor is, is still there. Oh, is it? Yeah, wow. the, the concrete floor itself is still there. The building is long yeah. gone. And uh, so that is on uh, St. Catherine. Okay. Yeah, uh, right in that triangle there where Excellent. I was telling you about. You. And yeah. if you go where the Rhythm Night Club is, you'll find Zion Chapel Baptist Church mm -hmm. where our first, 1868, our first black U.S. Senator and across from there was the uh, Mackle Funeral Home, which mm -hmm. was a large, uh, upstanding funeral home, you know, yeah. classic, classic. Matter of fact, they were the only one. they were black, but they were the only ones that had Clydedale horses at that time oh, wow. with the uh, yeah. buggies, you know. Yeah. So he saw this, and, he, ha and uh, he had come to a conclusion. This was a movement. And he wrote the long dream. Yeah. And you can imagine what was in the long dream. Now he came to see this, uh, the Rhythm Night Club that had burned. Mm -hmm. He seen where the H.R. Uh, Revel, and you saw this plantation. And all of this is in one little, I mean, it was yeah. within throwing, rock throwing area, you know. And he saw something there, and he, it gave him an idea. So here again, he has come back home to receive something to put in a book. So he was, uh, he started writing again or some other, I assume he was writing others too, but this is going back, he came back home to write about home. Right. And uh, some critics say that even in some of his later works when he was in France wasn't as strong because I guess he'd lost that connection to here. That is a possibility. Yeah. Because once you can relate to something or you can tie yourself to sure. something, you become, you can understand what you're writing and it becomes stronger, you know. Yeah, the ground was fertile after Oh, long. yes, yeah. very much so, very much so. And uh, there's one other thing that I would like to, point I would like to bring out sure. is that when I was a child, there was Ace Theater, mm -hmm. a, a movie, yeah. all colored entertainment. And I was somewhere in the neighborhood of six or seven years old. Mm -hmm. Native Son was shown at that theater. Really? Wow. Yeah. And I went there, and I'm sitting here looking at this uh, movie. And one of my teachers, she told me, she said, Charles, you know that's your cousin up there? I didn't know who he was, yeah. you know. Uh huh? Okay. But when he spoke, the dialect that he had was from here. I, I had heard it so many times out of all of my uncles yeah. and aunts and the way they spoke and the way they talked, it was still the same, you know, dialect of, of our language. And it's amazing how that was. Even now, when I look at Native Son, I think about my family, believe it or not. And he never did lose anything Whatever he gained, yeah. yeah. And sometime I wonder, did he take the hunger with it? Yeah, yeah, he probably <laughs> because, did. Because, yeah, and uh, but there was a hardship for him, and uh, he took it, you know, with him. And wherever he did, he he wrote quite a bit. Of it. And many of his his writings, I have like like I said earlier, I have opened his books and I've looked at them, and I began to read something, and then I can. It's I'll painful close, for you too. Yeah, yeah. It, it'll close it up because I can feel a lot of the pain that he was talking yeah. about, and I have seen it in my growing up yeah. here in Mississippi, you see. Well, I think it's fascinating, you and I were talking about this, and you said that um, in the 60s that you really, the family didn't really talk about the connection too no, much. No, no, it very much, very little did they talk about uh, Richard Wright. Yeah. And uh, I think Fabry, yeah. 
he came here and he wanted to interview families. Yeah. And he could find no one that really? would speak up, wow. you know, speak very, just, just minor things. Sure. Nothing in depth. And, uh, but he, uh, they just wouldn't, wouldn't speak about it. Yeah. And because of the uh, ties that his books didn't go below the Mason-Dixon line, and many referred to him as a communist. Yeah. They didn't, you know, really read the whole story into that, just mm -hmm. part of the way. And, uh, Which he did finally, he, he swore off the communist oh, party. Oh, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, because he found that uh, in my readings, I, I understand he, he saw the communists and the Southerners was no different. Yeah. Everybody's using somebody, yeah. you know, and uh, nobody's being helpful to, uh, and so that's what he was looking at, you right. know. And so, uh, so why jump from out of the pot into the skillet? Both of them are hot, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you talk about that in the 60s, nobody really talked about much, uh -huh. but now we live in, in Natchez today, and uh -huh. you can drive down Richard Wright Boulevard, you can see the marker, you, you know, you can go on your yeah. tour. Yeah. I mean, talk about how that attitude has changed now, and he's now celebrating. Uh, we do, uh, today when my children were in school, yeah. they studied his, his uh, writings, and there are people that does talk about Richard Wright. Uh, matter of fact, when we put the marker out there, we had one of the largest family reunions. Oh, no kidding. And, and, and yeah. And it's right on the bluff, right it, now where you go down to under yeah. the hill. That's, that's the ones on the bluff. If yeah. you're looking at the Rhythm Nightclub, then you got the Richard Wright marker. Yeah. Then you go out, you got the Richard Wright Highway. Yeah. The Memorial Highway. And so it, now Richard Wright is everywhere. Right. You know, and uh, we still have people that, the way he wrote, uh, it's kind of complicated to them. Yeah. And then again, uh, but then again, what he has said is true. Right. If and you understand it, the context of it, it makes you, it more you powerful. You have to, to understand yeah. the context of what he's talking about because if you didn't, you'll take it in the opposite direction. Yeah. If Richard Wright were still alive today, he'd be close to 108 years old, if my math yes. is right. Uh, if he came back to Natchez today, what would he find? Would he be happy? Would he be sad? Would he be worried? Uh, I think he would be sad for the simple reason uh, some things has gotten better. Right. But there are so many things that have not. And with our young people today as they are, the things that they, the way they are going in life and the way they uh, value life mm -hmm. is a zero. Yeah. And they not only, uh, there was one, one phrase that Richard Wright made, uh, this phrase he, he did, and I can't, but it sticks with me all the time. First, before you treat me as a black man, first, before you treat me as a man, first, I would love for you to treat me as a human being. And to say that, we as a people today do not even treat ourselves as human beings. We are becoming things of the world that to entertain one another and not to be progressive, not to be productive in our lives. And that's what hurts us. And I think that's what Richard Wright would, it would really hurt him a lot because he felt that uh, and the way I received him is that he wanted people not to be a white group, black group, or anything of this nature. Right. But he wanted people to come together in unity and one person. And we don't have that now. We've got it in so many different angles, you know, and we're doing this angle and that angle, and it's who does what better than this, and you know, and we are fighting ourselves, and then we're losing our dignity a lot. Yeah. And so, all of these things come to pass now, and we're, I think he would be sad. I really do. Uh, 
And I look at it and I think about it a lot, you know. It's just, just people, people. And we always want to stigmatize ourselves and this and that. And, yeah. And that's no good. Well, Charles, I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to, to visit with us today and really helping us understand the legacy of Richard Wright that much better. I hope so. I'm not good at this, but I... <laughs> I think you're pretty darn good at this. Thank you very much. So you did great. Thank you. Uh, thank you.